So you can't talk about stigma in mental health without talking about the most stigmatized procedure in all of medicine, and that is electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. Now, I personally provide ECT service on a weekly basis, and I've found myself at times hiding this fact from people. I don't necessarily like to always talk about it, and it got me thinking. Occasionally, I'll run into another health professional, say somebody not as familiar with psychiatry or mental health treatment, who will ask me, does this stuff really work? Isn't the procedure a little barbaric? Don't you think it's a little outdated? So even in the house of medicine, where other people are trained medical professionals, they're still skeptical and sometimes hold outdated ideas about the efficacy and safety of the procedure. Now, I always go back to the evidence. I think we need to go to the literature, and some people argue with me that the literature is informed by uh, drug companies and whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Point is, in as a whole, when you look at the literature, it's the most evidence-based way to base your clinical practice. So I go back to the evidence and I look at my own clinical responses as well. How have people done that I've treated with this procedure? And it reminds me why it's essential that I continue to provide this life-saving treatment. And a lot of times during their treatment course, people who are initially skeptical will come to me saying things like, you know, wow, I can't believe how much that patient improved. I'm surprised we, they, they did so well. You know, staff will comment on the improvement. The patient notices a significant change. And the family of the patient notices the improvement. And I always keep the option open for all of my patients who I provide ECT for to discontinue treatment at any time if they feel like the side effect profile is outweighing the benefits. But to my surprise, majority of the time, the patients want to continue treatment because they're, it's having a profound impact on their life and maybe it's the only thing that's actually ever helped them. So they usually are, I, I can't think of an example of anybody that I've treated that has wanted to leave the procedure prematurely before completing at least the index phase of the treatment. So this is an essential life-saving treatment that provides hope for people. It really provides hope for people who have had no relief from other treatment options. In all honesty, I think ECT should probably be considered much earlier in the treatment course than it usually is. So we know that People that the likelihood of a response to a medication decreases with each subsequent episode of major depression and each failed medication trial. So every time a person has another episode or has a failed medication trial, the likelihood that they're going to be successful with any treatment method, including ECT, starts to go down. So we want to try to get them treatment, get them better before that's the case. So let's go over my favorite part of this video, which is the 10 myths about ECT that I want to try to dispel for you guys here. The first one that comes up all the time, I said it earlier, it's a barbaric treatment that should be done away with, right? This could not be further from the truth. The procedure is performed in the same way any other medical procedure is performed in the hospital. There's a team of highly trained professionals, including a psychiatrist, a nurse, and an anesthesiologist in a controlled setting where the patient's administered anesthesia so that they're not aware of any of the things that are going on during the procedure as well as a muscle relaxant to prevent physical injury. And we also use other medications like Toradol to help with any pain that might occur after the procedure, headaches, etc. So it's not barbaric at all. It's performed in the same manner any other procedure in the hospital is performed with. Number two, it causes permanent brain damage. I can't tell you how many people have commented on my content here and said things like it causes permanent brain damage. Well, I can tell you I've researched the literature. I've looked at the studies. There's no evidence to support this claim, although it's often made by people. They've done the MRI studies and these MRI studies have never demonstrated any evidence of structural changes to the brain that occurred during or after treatment with ECT. On the contrary, there's actually evidence to demonstrate that ECT increases the size of certain brain structures. So it actually causes neurogenesis in many cases, and that's because it's increasing brain-derived neurotropic factor, and it's also increasing neuroplasticity and helping the brain to form new, hopefully better, connections. The third myth is it causes permanent memory loss. This is another one that gets commonly tossed out there. ECT can cause changes in anterograde and retrograde memory, so it can cause some impairment. However, in general, the anterograde amnesia only lasts 
days to weeks, and retrograde amnesia is much, much less common. Now, you can modify the ECT technique by placing the, the electrodes in a unila right unilateral placement, as well as using what they call ultra brief pulse, which reduces the risk of cognitive impairment. So there's ways to modify or tweak the procedure that also helps reduce the risk of memory problems. So number four, it's the last resort treatment. ECT is underutilized. And there's no reason to wait until someone has failed multiple medications and suffered with depression and potentially suicidal ideation for years before you go to this procedure. It can actually be used as a first-line treatment for a patient who is looking for an extremely rapid response and wants relief right away. And for anyone that's actively suicidal, anyone that's in a catatonic state, a patient that presents with psychotic depression, and those with severe depression that are not eating or attending to their ADLs. Number five, it only works for unipolar depression. Again, this could not be further from the truth. You can use ECT for bipolar depression. You can also use it for schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. It is commonly used for all of those things. Number six, it's simply not safe. It's not safe. So let's go over the rates, right? Let's go to the data and find out. So death from ECT is actually quite rare. The mortality rate is estimated to be 2.1 deaths per 100,000 treatments. So there's 2.1 deaths per 100,000 treatments. And you might say, Dr. Rossi, that sounds like a lot to me. I mean, that's 100,000 treatments and, you know, over two people end up dying from it. To put this in perspective, the mortality rate from undergoing general anesthesia used in a surgical procedure is actually 3.4 deaths per 100,000 procedures. So it's higher. So the, the rate of death from undergoing general anesthesia for a surgical procedure is higher than death from ECT. So that puts it in perspective. The next time you're thinking you're going in for that routine lap coli, just think that there is a risk of 3.4 deaths per 100,000 people for everyone that undergoes general anesthesia. And it's actually 2.1 deaths per 100,000 for ECT. So again, simply not true. It's as safe as all the other medical procedures and things that we perform. Number seven, it cannot be used for those who have seizure disorder. Again, not true. While yes, it is, it's not contraindicated in people with epilepsy. And we do know that there's higher rates of depression and other psychiatric illness in epilepsy. Most patients can be successfully treated and maintained on their anti-epileptic medication at the same time. So there's no reason to not treat somebody with a severe depression and, and, and an epilepsy diagnosis. Number eight, it changes personality. This is another really common myth that gets passed around all the time. If anything, people feel more like themselves when they start to see the improvements in the function with ECT. So it does not change your personality. And it's important to note that ECT is actually not effective for the treatment of personality disorder. So if somebody has only a borderline personality disorder, ECT is not going to be your best option for that patient. And in all reality, you should probably avoid it unless the person has a comorbid major depressive disorder that's treatment resistant or not responding to a medication trial, et cetera. Number nine, it's not an effective treatment. That's maybe one of the biggest uh, lies right there is that this is actually the more, probably the most effective treatment we have in all of psychiatry. So a lot of people, a lot of people think it's, it's not very effective, but 70 to 90% of patients treated with ECT show improvement in symptoms. So majority of people, a vast majority of the people who receive ECT do very, very well, and many actually achieve remission. And number 10, the final one that I want to talk about here, it takes a full 12 sessions to show improvement. This is not true. One of the big benefits of ECT is that it's a rapid onset of, of symptom relief. People start to see benefits very early on, possibly even within the first few sessions, and for at least within the first week of treatment, most of my patients have had some improvement in their mood at that point. Obviously, it's a case-by-case -case basis, and in order to achieve full remission, they probably need to complete the entire index phase of treatment. And it's important to also note that while this is an excellent treatment that can help keep people well longer than possibly medication treatment, it is not a cure for depression, and there is always the possibility that another depressive episode could emerge at a later time. With that said, 
I think I covered a nice little bit here about ECT. If you guys have questions or comments, drop them below. And if you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe to the channel. It helps me to keep making this content.